Hey there. Um, I strongly recommend my First Corinthians study. It's a long one, but uh, the intro, the, the First Corinthians, I think is going to be really good uh, for getting the guilties off and seeing how God reveals Christ in the middle of all of our stuff. <laughs> but anyway, um, I also want to do a, a few little messages on um, fake grace in the YouTube community. Uh, what, just what I, I counterfeit grace that we encounter a lot in the YouTube community. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who know what Lordship salvation is and false gospels. Uh, and even a lot now that understand what a backloaded works gospel is. A backloaded works gospel is when you say, yes, by grace through faith, we believe the gospel. But if you really believe, you'll have X, Y, Z. And then they add works. That's called backloading works into the gospel where the definition of faith changes to actually become a work. They've got a different definition of faith that means obedience or surrender or giving yourself to God or really believing. Believing not just with your mind, but also with your heart. When Paul says, uh, believe with our heart that Jesus is raised from the dead, he doesn't say, but not with your mind. No, the heart uh, and, and the mind are uh, they they overlap and function together. The heart thinks and the heart understands. The heart also feels. The heart also has the conscience. Um, but And the heart also has the will. But we understand the gospel with our heart, but the leading part of the heart is the mind. So you can't really just say, oh, you believe with your heart, but not with your mind. There's no way to believe with your heart, but not with your mind. <laughs> And you can't believe your with your mind, but not believe with your heart. That's impossible. Uh, that's like saying um, you moved your finger, but you didn't use your hand. You know, that, that doesn't make sense. But that is a tricky way that people try to slip in under the guise of grace, pretending to be grace, and bring you into bondage and destroy your salvation. John MacArthur is a very good example of somebody who uses the language of grace, but he is a wolf and his intention is not to give you grace, but to use the language of grace to actually overturn your understanding of salvation so that you go away with no hope, not hope. Okay. And there's different ways that that, uh, ways that where grace is counterfeited. And I'm not really interested in calling out blatantly false gospels. I'm more interested in uh, identifying um, substitutes for grace or counterfeits of grace because those are the ones that grace people are attracted to because they want the grace. They want to get free from legalism so that they can rest in Christ and so they're attracted to messages that have the language of grace and then they find themselves in another system of error. Um, and these are systems of error that are set up by men who lay in wait uh, to deceive, Paul talks about it, and they come through winds of doctrines that are driven by demons. They're evil spirits that drive these systems of error uh, by winds of doctrine. And so they need to be taught. You, we need to teach regularly and identify what they are. Uh, and so I just want to do a little series of shorter messages about what is the, okay, what is the root problem with this particular uh, phony grace Okay, now I'm going to do hyper dispensationalism because that is the first one I really encountered on YouTube. And I'm talking about in YouTube. There's plenty of stuff out in the world, but we're in YouTube. Um, the, the first big one that I encountered besides the backloaded works gospel, and even before the backloaded works gospel started making it around our community where people were saying, but if you really believe in using the new heart and all that stuff, was hyper dispensationalism. Um, hyper dispensationalism attracts people who understand that the word needs to be rightly divided and understand that legalism creeps in by confusing Israel's program with the church. Uh, the dispensationalists, the brethren, were people who understood that Paul was given a dispensation of the grace of God for the Gentiles to reveal a, minis a, a mystery concerning Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, And the dispensationalists pursued what is the revelation of the mystery? And how does that affect our life? And how is it that we're not under the law? And what does it mean to walk in the spirit as the rule of life versus uh, 
being under the law of Moses or the Synoptic Gospels, uh, Sermon on the Mount, we're under neither. We're to, we are crucified with Christ, raised up together with him to walk in newness of life. Uh, and the dispensationalists, as a consequence of that, also cataloged the, all the promises that were literally for Israel and said, these are not for the church, those are yet future for Israel. And that includes the new covenant. Uh, and they also discovered that one of the mysteries that Paul uniquely revealed was the rapture. And the reason they talked about the rapture was not to talk about everybody being disappearing all of a sudden on the earth as much as it was to show that the judgment seat for Christians was not something to be feared because it wasn't, it didn't have anything in common with the great white throne judgment where everybody's judged for every evil word and every thought they've thought and every thing they've ever done or the judgment of the sheep and goat nations where those who didn't feed the you know poor and didn't clothe the uh, naked and didn't visit the ones in prison uh, during the time of the tribulation actually that it's they're based on their treatment of the ones who have the testimony end up being goats who are thrown into the lake of fire uh, at the time that Jesus establishes his throne on the earth. They said, no, that is not the judgment seat that the church has. The church has something called the Bema seat, which is in the heavens when Christ is revealed, and he is revealed in the church, and he has built himself into the church, and the church receives a reward, uh, which is actually Christ's reward, which is related to the building up of the body of Christ, which is the habitation of God, the masterpiece of God, uh, Christ himself in his fullness put on display in the church. There is a work called the New Testament ministry, which produces that. And there is a celebration of that work, which happens after all the wood, hay, and stubble is burnt off. And there's a lot of wood, hay, and stubble uh, that will be burnt off, but that does not jeopardize your salvation, nor are you going to be inspected and punished for the quality of your life. No, your work is going to be tested by fire to see whether or not it belongs to the building. Anything that is actually part of the new city Jerusalem or part of the new creation of God will be revealed in that day to praise, honor, and glory, and anything that is not will be gone in the fire, and it will be lost. Okay, there's a lot of people putting a lot of effort in things that will be lost and burned up, even though they themselves will be saved and even rejoicing. And as we're seeing in Corinthians, he said to those carnal believers, he was absolutely confident that in the day of Christ, they'll be rejoicing. How could he say that? Because the testimony of Christ is confirmed in them, which it's the testimony of Christ that proves that we are okay at our judgment seat. We don't have to worry about the judgment seat. And so the brethren, the dispensationalists, pursued the truth for the sake of the conscience of believers. And they were uh, basically dealing with the lordship salvation of the day, Calvinism, and they were distinguishing truth from error. Now, the hyper-dispensationalists came out of that saying, yeah, Paul revealed a mystery, okay? And instead of pursuing the truth for the sake of the conscience of the believers, they said, so we should only read Paul. And Paul only is our food. And instead of spending their time going through the books of the Bible to really, uh, and this is going to be offensive to some people, but for example, Hebrews or 1 John, to, sh to dig out the food and make it into ministry uh, to build up the church, they said they tried to prove why these books are not for the church. And their, the root of their argument is that these books seem to have works in them and therefore can't be for the church because the church is not under works. But their argument is based on the fact that they believe that everybody other than the church has been justified by works from the beginning. They believe, and, and this is, don't let the hyper-dispensationalists fool you, they are not grace. They say that today we are justified by believing 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5, or 4, which is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose on the third day according to the scriptures. That sounds very good, but remember it's according to the scriptures. What were the scriptures at that time? Well, they were the Old Testament prophets. From Abel all the way on, from the time God spoke in Genesis 3, the gospel has been present, and those who believed it were justified by faith. From Abraham down, Abel down, 
They believed the promise of the seed. They knew blood had to be shed for the remission of sin. They knew that God uh, substituted a lamb in the place of Adam and Eve and covered them with its skins. Uh, and that's why Abel became a shepherd to offer the blood and the fat portion. Um, he wasn't justified by his offering. He was justified by what he believed before he ever had offered anything because God knows the hearts. Paul makes that very clear in Romans 4. So justification has never been by anything but faith apart from works, whether it's but under the law with in the case of David or before the law in the case of Abraham. And that justification in, secures forgiveness of sins and the inheritance. And it's all tied up in the promises God made to the seed, which is Christ. And the Old Testament saints believed in the seed. They believed in the promise that, uh, that was made to the Son of God. And Paul introduces the gospel in Romans as the gospel concerning his son that was promised before in the scriptures through the prophets. Why is that important? Because they say that 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 is the gospel. And before that, there was no gospel, essentially. And nobody believed it. And they were justified by works. And they use James 2 to say that. They say James was correct in saying that faith was by works. Uh that James is writing to the tribes of Israel. And then they say that John is for the Jews. First John, second John, third John is for the Jews. Hebrews is for the Jews. Uh, Revelation is for the Jews. The Synoptic Gospels are for the Jews. Everything is for the Jews except the books of Paul. And then there are different divisions of which books are for Paul. And some of them say only the prison epistles of Paul are for the uh church the rest i i mean and so you've got this little tiny bit of bible that you can read and uh they'll give lip service to not all the all the bible is for you but not all of it is to you but they will rebuke you if you study any of these books um now the thing is is hebrew all these books are for the church uh hebrews is a book for the partakers of the heavenly calling the sons of god who are being led into glory who now have access to the holiest uh, by the blood of Jesus and are one with the uh, the the one who's not ashamed to call them brethren, uh, who says, I will proclaim thy name in the midst of the assembly and I'll put my trust in him. Uh, and he is he is leading us, bringing us now into the presence of the Lord. Uh, and first, John is for the church. I, I don't I really don't have time to argue all this, but John the book of John, they'll say, well, that's for, for the Jews. And, and the, what they say is that J Peter and John were given to go to the Jews, and they say they had a different gospel that was faith plus works. Okay, so there's two concurrent gospels to two different bodies. There's the body of Christ, which is the Gentiles, and then there's this other little flock, which is the Jews, that God had two concurrent programs. And the thing is, is then you say, well, when, when was Israel cut off? You know, was Israel cut off? Because John was written after the temple was destroyed. They'll say, well, there was no problem with them going to the uh, temple and offering sacrifices and everything. <laughs> I mean, it's just, a, you, you'll get different arguments. It doesn't matter what their argument is. They will give you charts and graphs and they will tell you, like, they'll tell me, oh, you're an idiot. You don't understand the nuances of our theology. It doesn't matter if I understand the nuances of your theology because the root issue of your theology is this. Man can be justified by works. Okay? And the very fact that you say that shows me that you don't understand justification and you don't understand why Christ died and you don't understand the gospel. Uh, now, whether you're saved or not, a, a lot of people are saved but have been caught in a web of error. And they are not looking at the Bible anymore directly. It's not food to them. What they're looking at is a system that tells them this belongs to that, and this belongs to this, this belongs to that, this belongs to this, but there's no food. And they're very angry. Okay, It, it gets them puffed up in their mind and they become very angry. Um, the... And not only that, but they will tell you that you're going to be punished, which is a tell, at the Bema seat for not properly dividing the word the way they are. Well, then you really don't understand justification because nobody's going to get punished at the Bema seat. <laughs> you don't understand Paul's writing at all. You claim to be Paul, but all you argue for is works. You put me under works 
for not adhering to your system. And then you want to argue, what is the root of your argument? Are you trying to lead me to grace? No, you're trying to say that grace is for a limited few in the church age who believe 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5, or 1 through 4, minus according to the scriptures, because you don't believe the Old Testament saints believed the gospel, they were justified by works. Well, Paul said if righteousness could have come through the law, Christ died in vain. Uh, why did he rebuke Peter then? You know, Peter shrank back from the Gentiles when men from uh, uh, James came uh, for fear of those of the circumcision. Why would he be rebuked for that? He's just being consistent with, you know, he's going to minister to the Jews. He's going he's gonna to have a gospel for them. That would be consistent with that. Why can't they coincide? You know, and, and so they say, they try to say, well, no, it's just the Gentiles who weren't so supposed to be under the law. The Jews were just supposed to continue to be under the law. It's a mess. Um, but their point is not to give you your freedom in Christ. Their point is to argue, and it'll always come down to this because I've dealt with these people in my emails. They want to argue. They want to say, we can only read Paul. But then you want to, what do they want? Do you want to know what they talk about? They want to talk about James. Why do they want to talk about James? So that they can establish that justification is by works in the tribulation or prior to Jesus coming. And they don't believe that any of those saints could have known that Jesus was uh, going to die for their sins, even though it's clearly spelled out in the prophets. And he expected them to believe the prophets and judged Israel for not believing the prophets. Uh, it's a mess. And, and, and they bring people into bondage to their system and then they become violently abusive and divisive, and it's all they want to talk about. They go from wall to wall, and they're just wait. They're like the, you know, the people who say, if you say round, they'll say. Speaking of round, did you know the Earth is flat? Now, whatever you believe about that is not the point. But all you're doing is looking for an opportunity to drag everybody into that. You are an evangelist, not for Christ, but for your system. And Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing about among you, but Christ and him crucified. And these people don't talk about Christ. They don't talk about being identified with him in his death and resurrection. And they certainly don't care about fellowship. They tear up fellowship and divide it everywhere they go. And they pit people against each other and get them railing against uh, everybody. They're in, it's another form of works. And it's like Nicholas Getty said one time, it's a form of limited atonement where they believe only the people who belong to the church in this age are saved. And they say during the tribulation, it will be works again. Well, the problem with that is, is that if you get confused and think, uh Oh, we may be, maybe there isn't a rapture. Maybe we are in the midpoint of the tribulation. Then all bets are off. It's not grace anymore. It might be works if they're right. How do you know you're saved? So it, it, it's really important that you understand that justification always has been by faith. Now, if you come on my wall, argue this, I'll just delete you. I'm not going to spend any time. If you have questions about this, especially related to the tribulation, go to my Mark of the Beast Fears playlist uh, where I touch some of these issues because it's really important because these people are preaching a false, a false gospel, an accursed gospel to people you know who are going to probably most likely be in that hour. Uh People you know who are not going to be part of the church age are hearing a false gospel for the time that they're going to be saved. I think that's important. Um, but this system of error brings people into confusion uh, and it muddies the water. It, they, they contradict Paul at every point and they cut out. Somebody told me, somebody came on my wall and argued that Romans wasn't for the church. Said, Can't you see that's for the Jews? I don't have time for all that nonsense. Uh, these people have developed a really sophisticated system to avoid dealing with any of the passages they don't like. And th all the passages that they say are works are not, they're misinterpreted. And what it turns out when you say, okay, well, you know, like Hebrews, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 6, they believe that those actually say you can lose your salvation. And it's because they don't know Hebrews because instead of studying Hebrews, they say, well, that's not for us. See, it's just a way of not having to actually deal with the stuff. And I was attracted to it for a while, too, when I, uh, a few years, I don't know, 10 years ago, when I was like, okay, there's these 
I'm struggling with this book and I'm struggling with this book. And there's this system that says those books aren't for the church. Oh, that makes it easy. Then I don't have to wrestle with it. I don't have to study to show myself approve. All I have to do is memorize their charts and argue their points. And the thing is, is these people all argue the exact same points because it's a closed loop system. It's a finite, it's man's logic. So it's a finite system. They never say anything new. They just repeat and rehash the same points again and again and again. Uh, they're very smart. A lot of them are very intelligent. It, it, it does attract intelligent people, but they get locked into a grid. And so their mind is stuck. And whenever your mind gets stuck in a grid, the enemy can really use that to make you very angry. Where you are no longer set on Christ and the church, you are set on your system. He's replaced Christ with your doctrinal system that you're arguing for, and now you're going around beating everybody, but you think you're doing the Lord's work. So uh, watch hyper-dispensationalism. Take care.